In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. <clears throat> my Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, even Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. The first reading of today's Mass, a continuation of the readings from the book of the prophet Hosea. Thus says the Lord, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. You have collapsed through your guilt. Take with you words and return to the Lord. And say to him, forgive all iniquity and receive what is good that we may render as offerings, the bullocks from our stalls. Assyria will not save us, nor shall we have horses to mount. We shall say no more, our God, to the work of our hands, for in you the orphan finds compassion. I will heal their defections, says the Lord. I will love them freely, for my wrath is turned away from them. I will be like the dew for Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall strike root like the Lebanon cedar and put forth his shoots. His splendor shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like the Lebanon cedar. Again, they shall dwell in his shade and raise grain. They shall blossom like the vine and his fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. What a wonderful way to start our prayer. What a wonderful day to start wonderful way to start the day. This conviction of God's mercy. He's inviting us to begin the day, for not to say to begin our prayer, to begin any conversation we have with him. With that acknowledgement of our sinfulness, with that acknowledgement of our indigence, that nothing can save us as uh, what the, the prophet Hosea said, encouraging the people that Assyria will not save them. On the contrary, Assyria, Assyria was going to overcome them or had already overcome them. But they will be freed. Why? Because God has mercy on his people. And the same way for us. We feel ourselves broken, wounded by sin. Inept. And I, in, 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 with absolute destitution in front of the challenges confronting us in any given day, especially at the start of it. But we rely on God. He will save us. He will strengthen us. With reason, does that um, opening dialogue at the foot of the altar of the old Tridentine Mass declare it that way? In Turiba del Taride, a deum qualificat to the ma'am. I approach, I enter the altar of the Lord, the sanctuary of the Lord, the God who gives joy to my youth. If only we were humble enough. Not to rationalize. What's the point of justifying ourselves before God or rationalizing our position before him? He's not against us. He's not after our goat, so to speak. So we don't need to justify ourselves with him. He justifies us more than we want to justify ourselves. Precisely to the point of dying on the cross. What more justification can we ask for? When we offer lame excuses, justifications, rationalizing our position, we don't really improve things. We don't really change the fact that we are miserable. On the other hand, when God justifies us, he really does justify us. Brings us back to the condition of justice, of grace. Helps us get on our feet and overcome the difficulties. But we have to recognize it. 
for living in a world where people are so fond of not calling a spade a spade. So, a niece of mine was was very fond of writing uh, for op eds, you know, those um, opinion editorials. <clears throat> And she was asking me what my take was on the position of the feminists for life. You know, there's such a group. And that's their, shall we say, their um, advocacy. They are feminists, but they're for life. And as can be expected, their position, therefore, is a combination of right and wrong. As far as the wrong feminism is concerned, that's wrong, but they have enough perspicacity, they have enough honesty to recognize the value of life. Perhaps look at from the from the vantage point or from the position of feminism, but still, which just um, um, belabors the point that nobody really has a, a monopoly on 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 what's right, on truth. In the same way that nobody is so bad that everything that he or she says is, is bad. No. In this life, it will always be combinations, the chiaroscuro, combinations of darks and shadows. What's important is that we realize what's light and we recognize the shadows and be humble enough to accept help or rectification so that the shadows become light also. Didn't the Lord say, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. It's a given that we are imperfect. It's a given that we're miserable. After all, that's what we inherit from our first parents because of original sin we come to this life with a fallen nature damaged by sin and bereft of the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity, which was the original plan for man. God fashioned him from the slime of the earth and breathed into his nostrils his own breath that he thereto was just moving over the waters. And so therefore, what do you expect of a sinner if not to sin? What is expect of fallen nature except to act in a fallen way? Operatio sequitur naturam. Actions follow nature. We act according to what we are, and what we are are wounded. And in our woundedness, we're going to do wounded things. But I insist. Because our Lord insisted, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. But we have to allow ourselves to be vivified by God. We have to allow ourselves to be uh, revitalized by him, if not to, to say resurrected by him. And in order to do that, we must be humble. In order to do that, we must be strong to overcome the resistance of getting up again and just swallowing there in the mud. The resistance of the fear for the, the effort that would be necessary, not only for the getting up, but for staying up. But if we're humble, we know that even that will come from God. And so we allow ourselves to be helped. Oh, my brothers and sisters, when people make Christianity so difficult, when make the pursuit of holiness so, as they say, highfalutin, such that they give up on it even before trying, is their own choice. Our Lord already said, I have come so that you may have life and not only have it, but have it abundantly. But you have to allow yourself to be helped by me. The lepers were humble enough to go to our Lord and acknowledge their situation, their leprosy. Lord, heal us, son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy, can you imagine? And poor Lazarus, already decaying, already uh, giving off a stench. 
and our Lord tells him, Lazarus bene for us. Lazarus, come forth. And he obeyed. He came forth. Ephraim, Hosea continues, Ephraim was one of the tribes. What more has he to do with idols? I have humbled him, but I will prosper him. I'm like a verdant cypress tree. Because of me, you bear fruit. You see, those people were already fallen. They were overcome by the Assyrians because of their idolatry. And God forgave them. Embraced them back. Restored them to their condition as his chosen people. Or you and I, we go through the same procedure, the same process in a lifetime. So many booms and busts, so many twists and turns, so many rise and falls. But you know what? That's what makes this life, this temporal existence, shall we say, anxiety, if not hopeful. Because of our changeability from a condition of grace, we can fall to a condition of sin. Too bad. I really wish we wouldn't do that. But the flip side of that is, unless we die in the fall, and God is not like that. I remember that consideration of St. Cosa Maria, that God is not like a hunter waiting there in the corner, shooting us down in our worst moment like a hunter would, shooting down a prey in an unguarded moment, in a moment of carelessness. But rather, he's like a gardener or an horticulturist who takes care of a plant, fertilizes it, waters it, uh, cultivates around. And when it has already given uh, forth a flower, he doesn't, he waits still. He doesn't cut it immediately. He waits until it, it's in its finest moment. And then he cuts it to present to God. That's what he does with us too. And because precisely because of that thought, then even when we fall, for as long as we recognize that we have fallen and we're humble enough, we can get up. The very same temporality that is the reason why we fell is now going to be the opportunity for us to get up from that fall because we're not dead yet. It's not over until it's over. And God is like a gardener who won't make it over until he has given us enough chances, enough graces. And we ourselves have had enough chance, enough time to configure our eternity, to make that choice more representative, more permanent. So let's never lose uh, hope. Let's never get discouraged. I remember a film I watched long ago. I think it was called G.I. Jane or something like that. You know? it, it depicted the training of the Navy SEALs in the United States. And the training sergeant was telling them, he was telling the SEALs, you know, pain is good. He was telling them, pain is good. And you know why? Because when you feel pain, it means you're still alive. And that's it. If we recognize that we have fallen, we recognize that we have sinned, it means we're still alive. We're still in play. And the same God who gives us the light to see our mistake, to appreciate the reason for our fall, will give us the grace to get up again and continue as a son, as a daughter of God. That's the ascetical struggle. And that's what makes his life exciting. And that's why Christianity is not a religion for the losers. That's what some Marxists would say, that it's an opiate for the people. Opium are for those people who can't face challenges precisely and opt out of it getting themselves in that stupor, in that uh, hazy uh, brain fog to escape the challenges of this world. No, Christianity is for, it's not for those kind of people. Because Christianity is a religion of challenge. It's a religion of struggle. But it's also a religion of triumph. 
The reason why we struggle is because we are assured victory if we continue struggling. But the person who is not assured of victory definitely is a loser. Why are you struggling if you're not sure to win? What for? The gospel reading of today's Mass, taken from St. Matthew, continues in the same line. Jesus said to his apostles, Behold, I'm sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will be led before governors and kings for my sake, as a witness before them and the pagans. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. You will be given at that moment what you are to say. See, don't be afraid of the challenges. Don't be afraid of persecution. When that time comes, I will give you what you need. Sometimes people make themselves suffer uselessly, imagining all kinds of difficulties. What if this? What if that? Answer, if that really happens, God will take care of it. So don't worry about the future. As our Lord himself said, sufficient for the day, its own challenges, its own uh, problems. Because grace, actual grace, comes at the moment when it's needed. God is a master of just-in-time deliveries. You know, those of you who are uh, engaged in, in the supply chain, you don't like too early deliveries because then you build up an inventory or too early deliveries and you have there a stockpile of things. They're occupying space. You don't want them to be late either because then he, it holds up production. What you want is just in time delivery. And God is a master in that. To the point that sometimes I've heard people complain, oh, Lord, I know that you give me what I need, but can't you give me a little bit more with a little bit more of, of leeway so that I don't need to worry whether it's going to come or not? Well, that times God does that. But many other times he doesn't do that precisely because he wants us to be abandoned to him. He wants us to trust him. Trust me. So you're not even sure anymore whether the, the step after the next one, there's still ground there. But trust me. Just get there and you will see there will be. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that what will keep you young instead of getting bored with everything so, so secure and so clear? uncertainty about temporal things is exciting as long as we're certain about God. On the other hand, certainty and temporal things, if we're uncertain about God or even factor him out, wow, that's really uh, risky, or not to say that's really a cause for insecurity, among other things, because temporal things can never be that certain. I see they're temporal. Even the very fact that I'm gi uh, giving this meditation now and you're watching me and that um, whatever uh, apparatus, whatever gadget you have, you can't be sure that you're going to finish the, this meditation with that, okay? 99% most probably, but it can conk out. You can run out of battery or the service might get interrupted. One of those things can happen because we're temporal. But you know what's not temporal? What's eternal? And what's therefore secure? And therefore we should be certain of? It's God and his providence. And his plan that we be saved. That's why our Lord was telling the apostles, don't worry. You will be given this when the time is needed. You will be given at that moment what you are to say. For it will not be you who speak, but the spirit of your father is speaking through you. Brother will hand over brother to death, and the father is child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen. I say to you, you will not finish the towns of Israel 
before the Son of Man comes. The world gives you lemons, make lemonade and marmalade. And if you're really good at it, even uh, a, a lemon tort, hmm? a lemon d'aqua. Uh, and make very good layers out of it, like 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 a a, a sans rival made out of lemon. Why? Because God is giving you the lemon and the talent and the graces at each moment. We have to end. This life is wonderful because it's what God has given us. And God makes wonderful things. Because of fallen nature, we may damage it and we may know we do. And because the others have fallen nature too, they also damage it and we wreak havoc on each other and we cause pain to each other. But as I said earlier, it ain't over until it's over. God will give us what we need to make wonderful things out of the lemons that this world and our fellow men give us. God will give us the time to do all that and the graces that we shall need to rise about that and make out of all of those a great offering like incense rising to heaven. This is not a pep talk. Rather, it's a cool, <laughs> objective glance at reality. But the thing is reality. It's not just the physical reality. It's not even just the spiritual, non-physical reality. It's also the super naturality. Not just nature, but super nature. And we have to learn how to move in that orbit, how to move in that plane. Because when we do, then we will be the happiest people on earth. Why? <laughs> because we're secure in the embrace of the blessed trinity. And happy on earth, we will just segue to the eternal happiness of heaven. That too was one of the lessons that the founder of Opus Dei, San Jose Maria, repeated, especially towards the end of his life. And I am certain he said that they are happy in heaven, those who knew how to be happy on earth. So let's go to our Blessed Mother as always. We call her Spes Nostra, Sed the Sapiens, the seat of hope, seat of wisdom, cause of our joy, causa nostra de litizia. And she's the cause of our joy because like any mother, they, she facilitates the way. And she whispers at the right moment what we need to do. And many times what we need to do is according to her, just to do whatever her son tells us. Do whatever he tells you. And with that conviction, with that cheerfulness, with that uh, security in divine providence we feel each day the jars of each day all the way to the brim and then our lord would transform those waters those that ordinary work uh, those human relations into the best of wine that can be offered up to god you have a few minutes left to formulate your resolutions and end this prayer mm -hmm.